So, Hillary Clinton thinks religious discrimination is bad. On Thursday, the New York Times ran a report on Muslim parents living in fear of Donald Trump. I had a scary dream about Donald Trump, screamed the headline. Real headline. Muslim parents face a tense election. Here's a segment of the amazing hit piece. This is a quote from the New York Times. It was the morning after the second presidential debate, which the El Charfa family's two youngest daughters watched in the basement of their Staten Island home with their parents. In the middle of the night, Maria went to her parents' room twice, unable to sleep, and walked to the living room and checked her family security camera. That morning, Mr. El Charfa 52 asked his daughter what she saw in the nightmare. Quote, he was so mean to us, she said. He had a scary face, like a zombie or something. In the dream, Maria said later, Mr. Trump came to the home of every Muslim family in the country and put each one in jail. Don't worry, he told his daughter, comforting her. He's just talk. He tried to sound convincing, but her nightmare unsettled him. <laughs> this is really true. Like before Halloween in the New York Times, the piece linked violence against Muslims to Trump, of course. 2015 featured 260 hate crimes, according to the FBI, against Muslims. This was apparently a huge uptick, but still way lower than the 647 instances targeting Jews, who constituted nearly 57% of all hate crime victims. Hillary, of course, responded to the New York Times piece with alacrity on Twitter, she said, This is heartbreaking. No child in America should feel afraid to practice their religion or embrace their heritage. Well, that's fine talk from the same lady who once proclaimed that anyone who did not comply with her views on social leftism ought to give up their religion. In 2015, she said, quote, Far too many women are still denied critical access to reproductive health care and safe childbirth. Laws have to be backed up with the resources and political will and deep-seated cultural codes, religious beliefs, and structural biases have to be changed. So much for embracing our heritage. If you won't bake a, gay, a cake for a gay wedding, time to give up Jesus, like right now. Hillary is also the same woman whose campaign director, John Podesta, received an email from Sandy Newman of Voices for Progress that calls Catholicism, quote, a Middle Ages dictatorship in need of a little democracy and respect for gender equality in the Catholic Church. Podesta issued no challenge to such bigotry. Religious Americans across the country hold our breaths thanks to Hillary Clinton. The Democratic Party seeks to quash religious nonprofits, religious day schools, even nunneries that don't comply with its wishes on everything from abortion to contraception to same-sex marriage. Hillary doesn't get to pretend to defend religion while paving the way for its destruction. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So much good. Okay, so, all right. I'm so excited, people. The FBI has now reopened its investigation into Hillary Clinton's emails. I'm not joking. This is not an April Fool's prank. This is not an early Halloween trick or treat. This is reality, and I will get to all of that in just a second. But first, we have to say hello to our friends from Birch Gold. If things seem chaotic, if it seems like the entire world is on the verge of explosion, now might be a good time to think about investing in precious metals. Birch Gold's a great place to do that. They're the precious metal IRA specialists. If you have an IRA or 401k, you can shift that into precious metals, and uh, you can do so uh, without tax consequences. But you have to talk to my friends over at Birch Gold Group, A plus rating from the Better Business Bureau. Uh, part of your portfolio should be in precious metals. Part of mine is not the whole thing, but make sure you ask all your questions and go to birchgold.com slash Ben. Use birchgold.com slash Ben to get a no-obligation, no-cost kit, 16-page kit explaining how to invest in precious metals and what all of that means. Okay, so big show today. We're going to have on Dana Perino in just about 20 minutes here. We'll talk about we'll talk with her about her new book, uh, Let Me Tell You About Jasper, which is going to hit the New York Times bestseller list, I have no doubt. And we'll also be de deconstructing the culture a little bit later, and there's so much to talk about just generally. But... But the big news of the day is that the FBI has now dropped a bombshell. Bombshell doesn't really describe it properly. A nuclear warhead onto the Clinton campaign. This is amazing. He sent a letter to eight congressional committee chairmen. Here is the text of the letter. Dear Mr. Chairman, in previous congressional testimony, I referred to the fact that the FBI had completed its investigation of former Secretary Clinton's personal email server. Due to recent developments, I am writing to supplement my previous testimony. In connection with an unrelated case, the FBI has learned of the existence of emails that appear to be pertinent to the investigation. I am writing to inform you that the investigative team briefed me on this yesterday, and I agreed the FBI should take appropriate investigative steps designed to allow investigators to review these emails to determine whether they contain classified information as well as to assess their importance to our investigation. Although the FBI cannot yet assess whether or not this material may be significant, and I cannot predict how long it will take us to complete this additional work, I believe it is important to update your committees about our efforts in light of my previous testimony. So Comey doesn't want to be caught out as a perjurer saying there was no evidence that she knew that the private server was exposed to hack or there was no evidence that she did it with extreme carelessness. He doesn't want to be caught in a perjury trap. 
And he also doesn't want to be caught in in this particular trap where a bunch of classified emails are revealed that Hillary Clinton knew about and knew were exposed to foreign hack and put on her private server anyway. And then he gets in all sorts of trouble because here's sort of the timeline, right? A few months ago, he kills the investigation. He says that, that Hillary should not be indicted by the Department of Justice. And then the next thing that happens is all of these emails start cropping up. What he doesn't want is he knows he's going to have to reopen the investigation in three weeks anyway. He's going to be forced because everybody's going to know the information. And then he'll be accused of being the ultimate political hack, a guy who shut down the investigation just in time to get Hillary Clinton elected and then reopen the investigation right after Hillary Clinton was elected. So to avoid looking like a political hack that he clearly is, he's now going to reopen the investigation and announce it publicly 11 days before the election. So, I mean, this is crazy stuff, gang. I mean, this is the, the real reason that James Comey shut it down, as everybody knows at this point, is that he was attempting he was attempting to protect her for the election. He was hoping that that would be the end of it. It was not the end of it. And now it's exposed that he did it for political reasons, and he doesn't want to look super duper political by reopening it after her election. So it looked like he shut it down the entire time. So he's going to do it now, 11 days beforehand, so he can put down his marker and he can say, I wasn't political. The FBI wasn't political. We gave you the information as it became available to us. Therefore, if you elected Hillary in spite of that, that's your problem, but it has nothing to do with me. Right? This is James Comey, who is a political hack, covering his political ass. And it's glorious because now we have two wrongs making a right, right? This rarely happens in real life. Two wrongs generally don't make a right. In this case, they sort of do. So he, he originally killed the investigation, which was wrong. And now he's reopening the investigation without giving us all the evidence, which normally would be kind of wrong, except that he never should have shut the investigation in the first place. So it's all hilarious. It is all funny. And watching all of these people on the left running around today and flipping their opinion on James Comey, he went from the great lawgiver, the great lawbringer, the, the, the wonderful man. He went from that to political hack, partisan, working for the Republicans. On the Republican side, there are some people who are going right now from he was the worst partisan hack ever to honest man, James Comey. Always told you like that, James Comey. And then there's me. I say he's corrupt all the way through. Uh, he's been corrupt since the beginning. He's corrupt now. This is what we call political ass covering. And fine, I don't care. The investigation is reopened. And now Americans are going to have to look dead into the face of the actual prospect that the president-elect of the United States, if Hillary is elected, may be arrested and charged. Right? And, and what's Obama going to do? Pardon her right after she got elected? The happiest man, by the way, in America right now is not Donald Trump, who is, is certainly happy. The happiest man in America is Tim Kaine, who's sitting somewhere going, my God, I could be president in like three weeks here, right? I mean, we, we're in the actual situation where me, this nobody from Virginia who nobody likes and I'm kind of weird, I could be president of the United States just because Hillary could get impeached like the day after she's elected or arrested the day after she's elected and boom, look at that. Tim Kaine's the president. Wow. Wow. So, I mean, this is nutty, nutty stuff, folks. I have to give credit to uh, my friend Andrew Clavin. Drew is wrong about a lot of things, um, but he is correct on this. He's been saying for months that the other shoe is going to drop, right? He's been saying on his show for a long time there'd be one more twist in the campaign. I assume this is the twist in the campaign. If you think this is fun, though, wait till Monday, because I promise you the Democrats have been keeping a bunch of dynamite stored up about Donald Trump in their basement, and they were gonna, just going to hold it, because what's the purpose? And now that this is broken, they're going to have to dump every piece of oppo on Donald Trump you've ever not wanted to hear about. So the Donald Trump horse sex tape will come out Monday morning, courtesy of the DNC. I mean, that's where this is going. Every piece of garbage about these two candidates will come out, and I am over the moon about all of it because, come on, I mean, if you can't enjoy the circus, then why pay for the ticket? So, wow, this is, I mean, this is just wild stuff. So, Paul Ryan has already released a statement. <coughs> he says that the director of national intelligence should suspend all classified briefings for Clinton until this matter is fully resolved. Well, she's going to be president-elect in like a week and a half if the polls don't shift. By the way, the polls are shifting in Trump's direction. They have been shifting in Trump's direction. In the Real Clear Politics poll average, she was up like seven points two weeks ago. That poll average is now down to 4.4 points. In a lot of the swing states, it's still very close. He still has a long haul to make. But my God, I mean, if he can't capitalize off, my opponent is going to go to jail, right? If he's or could go to jail, and the FBI just said it. I mean, this is honest to God. I haven't had time to tweet it yet, but I'm going to. Okay, this is this is Hans Gruber turning to Theo in Die Hard and saying, "Theo, you ask for miracles, I give you the FBI." I mean, that's that, that's where we are at this point. Okay, so the uh, Bob Goodlatte, who's the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee. He's released a statement about the Comey reinvestigation, quote, 
The FBI's decision to reopen its investigation into Secretary Clinton reinforces what the House Judiciary Committee has been saying for months. The more we learn about Secretary Clinton's use of a private email server, the clearer it becomes that she and her associates committed wrongdoing and jeopardized national security. Now that the FBI has reopened the matter, it must conduct the investigation with impartiality and thoroughness. The American people deserve no less, and no one should be above the law. Again, this is what happens when you go political. If you're James Comey, this is what happens when you sell your soul. If you sell your soul, it turns out that the devil is going to be there to collect, and the devil is there to collect for James Comey, who now is being condemned by both sides of the aisle as a partisan hack, a guy who had basically uh, a spotless reputation just about eight months ago, uh, has now been tarred and feathered as well he should be. And, uh, and I find the entire thing absolutely hilarious. What's hilarious about it, too, is that the media was prepping their the media was prepping their approach. Their approach was going to be they they were doing the same thing in their way that Comey is doing now. The media's approach here was going to be Hillary's going to win anyway. Now's the time when we criticize her about her corruption. This is the game the media play in order to demonstrate that they are that they're not corrupt, even though they are. In order to demonstrate that they're not lefties even though they are. What the media do is they wait until the most opportune moment for the Democrat, and then they dump all of the all of their criticisms about the Democrat. And then later, when you say, you guys never criticize the Democrats, they say, no, 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 we did. And you say, right, that's when your Democrat was already winning. They say, but we did. We did, remember? We did. We reported on it. Sure, it was when the election was basically over already. That's when we reported on it. So this is the problem for Hillary. The last week, Democrats, assuming she's going to win, have started to have started to criticize Hillary because they assume it's not going to do any damage. And it plays right into the narrative that she's corrupt. And then Comey hits them with the bomb and boom, Hillary's re-indicted, right? Or she's re-under investigation. It's amazing stuff. So Chris Matthews, here's Chris Matthews last night, right? Criticizing Hillary Clinton under the safe assumption she was going to be elected. Well, I'll make a judgment. Every time I watch the politician engage in a certain pattern of behavior, go to the White House, they continue to engage in that pattern afterwards. People don't change because we swear them into the White House. They become that person big time. And, and the Clintons were raising money like this hand over hand back in, hand over fist back in 1996 using, we call it Motel 6. They were bringing, hoarding them in, pulling them in by, by train loads of contributors and then letting them sit in the Lincoln bedroom for a while and then charge them by the hour. This is what they did before. This is what they did. You can still vote for Hillary Clinton, but remember, you're getting this as part of the package. Because that's been their pattern. So Chris Matthews on MSNBC going after her, what appears to be as hard as I would there, right? This is what Hillary Clinton does. And she, she's basically a political whore. I mean, I wouldn't say whore, but she kind of is. I mean, not like she's standing on the street corner, but it depends on the street corner. She wears hooker outfits and everything. And I would say, go. Come on, over this show. Chris Matthews goes after Hillary really hard there, right? But he's doing that under the, in, under the assumption she's going to win. <laughs> Now, Chuck Todd does the same thing. Chuck Todd comes out yesterday, and he's a hack from, MS, from NBC, and Chuck Todd says, I don't see how the Clintons can even keep the Clinton Foundation going in the face of all of the new information we got earlier this week about them using the Clinton Foundation basically as a, as a front for them, to, for them to raise money on the side for Bill Clinton's pocket. Look, let me go to the bottom line. There is no way on any circumstance that the Clinton Foundation should have um, – to be operating if she becomes president. I just don't, I don't see how they keep that going. I just don't. So he doesn't see how they keep, and, and you can see the Democrats are trying to cover their butts in the media now, and, and they're doing so by saying, okay, now we're going to criticize Hillary, and that way later when she wins, and you say that we were that we were partial for her, we can point back to comments like this and say, no, 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 we were critical of Hillary Clinton before the election. That's what Comey is doing in his own way as well. But now it's all backfired, because they've made the case this entire week that she's super corrupt and can't be trusted, and then boom, Comey comes back with, we're reopening the investigation into her emails. So now what do they do? Now what do they do? Because now the election's actually in jeopardy for them, and they're making Trump's case. They're making the conservative case. They're making the Republican case. They're making the case against Hillary Clinton. They were doing so thinking it was all going to be okay for them. And now they did it, and they're going to pay a price because this is going to hurt her really badly. I mean, the election is not far enough out. This is not far enough out that it's not going to hurt her in the polling data. I mean, I'm looking at the polls right now from Real Clear Politics. Okay, here's how close this election still is in a lot of these states. In Florida, Clinton is basically in a dead heat with Donald Trump, which means, he, given this sort of thing, he probably should win Florida. In Ohio, Trump is up. In Pennsylvania, it's a five-point race. In New Hampshire, it's a 6.5-point race. But 
In North Carolina, Clinton's only up by 2.4. Okay, this could shift North Carolina back into Trump's category. In Nevada, Clinton's only up by two. This could shift Nevada back into Trump's category. In Michigan, Clinton's up by six. In Wisconsin, she's up by 6.7. In Colorado, she's up by 6.2. But in none of those states is she running anywhere close to 50%. Right? Trump's at like 37 in Michigan. He's like 38 in Colorado. Right? He's going to lose Virginia, I would assume. But there are some states that are in play here for him. He still needs to pull Wisconsin or Michigan. He still needs to pull some of these states that are a little more outliers. But if this really does damage to her, it could happen. It could happen. This is, this is an election-changing moment. Or it could be if Donald Trump can demonstrate any sort of discipline. right? If he can demonstrate any sort of discipline, and all he should say from now on is James Comey's name. It doesn't matter what the question is. Mr. Trump, did you sexually assault 27 different women in a row at a nightclub in 1997? James Comey. Right? It, shouldn't, it shouldn't matter. Nothing. That should be the only thing that comes out of his mouth. Two words that come out of his mouth for the rest of the election cycle, James Comey. That's it. That's all he should say. Just over and over, I've been hypnotized, James Comey. Right? It's, that's, that's all. And if he does that, maybe, maybe he has a shot. Maybe he has a shot because this is wild. Now, as I say, do I expect that, that Donald Trump will be able to do that? No, because he hasn't thus far. Do I expect that the Democrats will drop every piece of oppo they have ever found ever on anything on Donald Trump in the next several minutes. Yeah, I think that's probably what's going to happen. But th- this is, I mean, this is wild. This is wild stuff, folks. I've never seen anything like it. I, this, this entire election is insane. And as just an impartial observer of this election, since, as you know, I'm not for either of these candidates, this is the most highly amusing election all truths are being revealed by the amount of insanity in this election cycle. We're, we're living inside. I mean, this is, this is it's better than fiction. It's better than fiction. It, it really is. Not better than the fiction book I wrote, True Allegiance, go buy it now. But it's better than all of the other fiction. It really is incredible. Who would have thought 11 days out from an election, we're going we're gonna to see Donald Trump in a courtroom screaming at the judge, you're corrupt. This verdict's corrupt. You're all corrupt. It's all rigged. And here's the thing. No matter what Comey says for the next week and a half, Trump wins on this issue. If Comey says, yeah, it turns out it was no big deal, Trump goes, it was rigged again. And then if Comey comes out and he says, arrest her and put her in jail, he's going to say, right, lock her up. It's, I mean, Donald Trump has to be, uh, Kellyanne Conway is over the moon. She's tweeting impolitic things like, we're having a great day in this campaign and this makes it even better. Right? She actually tweeted that. That's Kellyanne Conway, not Trump. So everybody in the Trump campaign is just over the moon. Also, it shifts the, the, the news in the election cycle away from the fact that Donald Trump has severely underspent what he promised he would spend on his own campaign and has no ground game and is preparing to go to war with everybody and is making a day to play for after the election. We don't talk about any of that stuff now because a major party candidate is now under reopened investigation. It's, it's absolutely hysterical. I mean, I, I just I, I love every second of the this that it is possible to love. If I could have sex with this particular news story, uh, I would I would ask my wife for permission. But this is it's it's unbelievable. <laughs> wow, just wow. Okay, so and by the way, if you think this is comedy, and if you like comedy, then you should check out our friends over at CISO. So CISO is a new service, and they they are they are a full comedy specialty subscription service. So you go to CISO.com, and CISO.com, spelled like you see here on the screen, they have like every old episode of SNL, even back when it didn't suck. They have all of the, the all of the old episodes of Parks and Recreation, which is one of my favorite comedies. Uh, they have all of the old The Office from, from Britain. They're a comedy service. They're like Netflix, except for comedy. And, uh, and they are better than all these other services because they are specifically comedy-oriented. Uh, they also have a bunch of original series. Uh, they have a, 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 there's a new one that I've, I've started watching that's pretty funny. It's called Hidden America with Jonah Ray, and, and it's basically a uh, it's basically a travel it's a travel log making fun of Anthony Bourdain. They go to real places, but all the characters are fake, uh, and it's it's pretty funny. So CISO.com, s e e s o dot com. You get two months free with the promo code Ben at checkout. That's CISO.com promo code Ben. And if you need more laughter, and we're all going to need more laughter because we laugh so we don't cry, folks. CISO.com slash Ben is the place to do this, and it's. It's like three ninety nine a month even after that, so it's a really, really good deal. Uh, CISO.com, again, use promo code BEN at checkout, and you get two months for free. So you can try it out. If you don't like it, obviously, then you don't have to purchase it, but it is a, it is a great service. My wife and I have been really enjoying it. CISO.com, slash, and then you use the, the promo code BEN. Okay, so uh, I, I would love to talk about... 
uh, anything uh, about about other topics today. But actually, I wouldn't. I'd, I'd much prefer to talk about this because this is just the greatest thing that ever happened. So. Online, everything's exploding and it's happening in real time. I mean, people are just going nuts over this. Hillary Clinton has deplaned. She waved happily and got into an SUV, where she promptly fell down in the back seat, unconscious. When they woke her up, she just started crying hysterically and shouting Huma Abedin's name. Uh, Comey is uh, Comey is hidden. He hasn't said anything at all. Uh, Donald Trump, by the way, announced this at one of his rallies, and the supporters started chanting "Lock her up." Of course. <laughs> pretty spectacular, pretty spectacular stuff. And the nice thing is that Trump, this is something Trump should be able to do. For the next 11 days, Trump should be able to just say Hillary is corrupt over and over again because this is the one thing that he's good at, right? So here is Donald Trump yesterday before this came out saying, and this is good Trump, right? We, this, is, this is Donald Trump doing the right thing, saying Hillary lives the high life at your expense. The elites in government, like Hillary Clinton, believe they're entitled to do whatever they want. Hillary Clinton has never earned an honest dollar. Well, I think that's really, you know, hey, let's put it this way. What she's done to our country is a disgrace, and she should be ashamed of herself. She lives the high life at your expense, making money off the rig system, and it is a rig system. Are you starting to agree with me about the rig system? This is an election between the small handful of people who benefit from the corrupt system and the great majority of American citizens who are the victims of that same corruption. Those who benefit from the corruption will say and do anything to keep it the way it is. They don't want change. Okay, so Trump's whole rigged argument reads a lot better when the FBI is opening and reopening investigations into Hillary for political reasons. It is. It just, it like, even Trump's jokes that the media are going nuts about right now, they play better because of this news about Comey reopening the investigation. So, for example, Trump joked yesterday that everything is so corrupt they should just cancel the election and make him president. As part of our plan to bring back American jobs, we will lower taxes on our businesses from 35% down to 15%. We'll go from the highest to among the lowest. Hillary Clinton wants to raise taxes on small businesses up to 45 percent. What a difference. You know, what a difference this is. And just thinking to myself right now, we should just cancel the election and just give it to Trump, right? What are we even having it for? What are we having it for? Her policies are so bad. Boy, do we have a big difference. Okay, so he drops that and people go nuts. Oh, he's saying we should cancel the election. But one of the points that he's been making is the entire system is rigged, and now you have the FBI playing footsie with Hillary Clinton back and forth, prepping for the election. It makes all of the conspiracy nuts sound not so nutty anymore when this sort of game is being played with the federal investigative power. It's truly, it's truly incredible stuff. I mean, it's in so, you know, a, a lot of the Trump craziness doesn't sound so crazy. When, when this is happening. A lot, by the way, in, in terms of the movement for Trump, there are a lot of people who are jumping back on the Trump train. Uh, just in time, Mike Pence is making the case that everybody should, should come home to Donald Trump, that somehow, you know, it's, it's time, the time has come, you have to come back. And, and it's working, it's working, what Pence is saying. I mean, the truth of the matter is, there's, there's only two names on that ballot that, he, that have a chance to be president of the United States of America. And while I'll always respect the right of any man or woman to cast their vote, in the manner that they seem best. I gotta say to you from my heart, I truly do believe a vote for any candidate other than Donald Trump is a vote for a weaker America at home and abroad. A vote for any candidate other than Donald Trump is a vote for an America that continues to walk away from our highest ideals of life and liberty and our Constitution. And a vote for any candidate other than Donald Trump Bottom line is the vote to make Hillary Clinton the 45th president of the United States. Pushing that, and it's working. Nikki Haley has now jumped on the bandwagon. She says she'll vote for Trump. Jason Chaffetz says that, that he's going to vote for Trump in Utah. So, you know, it's, it's so the, things are coming together for Trump. Is it too little, too late? Well, you know, not if James Comey has his way. That's, that's an amazing story. It's unbelievable. Well, joining us on the line right now is one of the best 
commentators in American politics. Uh, Dana Perino, of course, you've seen Dana Perino on Fox, and uh, you see her on The Five all the time. And, uh, and Dana, do we have Dana on the phone? Dana? I'm here. Hey, Dana, how are you? I'm great. How are you? I think we're in the Mutual Admiration Society because I think you're amazing. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Dana has a brand new book out. It's called Let Me Tell You About Jasper. Uh, and it's all about her. If you've ever spent any time on Twitter, her dog is like the biggest thing on Twitter. Uh, and this, this book is destined for the best title list because it really is a feel, feel good book in a, in a not so feel good time. But, Dana, obviously, before I want to ask you some questions about the book. But before we get to that, I have to yeah. ask what your take is. Yeah, please. Uh, and, and let me tell you if you don't get to the book, it's fine with me because we've got a lot of news to cover. Okay. Okay, so let's, so the, okay. Since you've given me the excuse, I promise I'll get. I will ask a couple questions about the book, but I, I do want to start by asking you. I, I need to start by asking you about the, this this Comey announcement that they're basically reopening the investigation into Hillary Clinton's emails. Uh, to me, a couple of things are happening. One, the investigation never should have been closed. Two, this is Comey covering his butt because he knew he was going to have to reopen it. Didn't want to wait until after the election to do it because then it would look like he had shut it down for his friend Hillary. Why do you think that though? Well, why do why, why, why do you think he knew he would have to reopen it? Because I think that he actually has seen emails that suggest that he's going to have to reopen it. So Pete Williams of NBC News apparently just reported that um, it wasn't emails that they found, but a device. Oh wow! Which might have email on it. Now I don't I don't know if that's true, but Pete Williams is a pretty solid reporter um, from the he, and he works at the Justice Department. And actually, covered the Justice Department since even before I worked there and in 2001 so there might be an actual device mm -hmm. there might be even more emails it's not her device apparently but maybe somebody from the campaign right so one of the reasons that people are all over this is because of the timing obviously we wouldn't be talking about this yep. so much if we weren't 11 days prior to the election so paul krugman of the new york times is going nuts he says this means comey's a political hack and people on the right are saying well now back back then back when he got rid of the investigation in he was july, a they called, <laughs> yeah, in july the republicans called him a political hack <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. So now everything has flipped. You know, my feeling is that like what's weird about the the piece of the the, the letter that that he sent, that Comey sent, is that he basically said we don't even know what we have yet, but I'm just announcing it now. And that's why I think what's happening is that he's concerned that it's going to come out later that there actually is indictable material on this thing, and he doesn't want to be accused. He doesn't want the FBI to be accused as an institution of having hidden material and hidden information yep. prior to the election to help Hillary Clinton. That's probably right. And the other thing, I think he was facing um, a little bit of a mutiny from his um, upper ranks. Yeah, exactly. Um, with several FBI agents saying that they were very unhappy that Comey made that decision. And you're a lawyer, so you would know. But And I worked at the Justice Department, so maybe I would know. <laughs> but it was so unprecedented to me that um, Comey came out in July and gives this whole long list of all the things Hillary Clinton has done wrong. And he almost felt like he was leading up to say, and that is why we are going to charge her with X or Y. Right, exactly. Instead, he says, he said, oh, yeah, but despite all that, no one could ever get a case prosecuted against her, so we don't recommend an indictment. But it is not for the FBI director to it to decide whether they're an indictment or not. That's for the Justice Department to decide. Right, that's why it was so bizarre when he when he said he was going to recommend or not recommend. I think recommend. they're trying to protect the Justice Department. Yeah, exactly. He was taking he was taking the he was falling on the sword for Loretta Lynch, who by the way declared today that she she actually declared the fifth. She she pled the fifth with regard to these Iran ransom payments. So the whole Obama administration <laughs> is not appearing in a very good light right now, which of How course How can is, you plead the fifth when you're the cabinet secretary? It's insane. I mean, she's pleading and not only a cabinet secretary, she's the attorney general of the United States pleading the fifth. She's the chief law enforcement officer but, in the country. Pleading the fifth to what? Like what's the crime? Right, exactly. What are you worried about? That's weird. May, I mean, is it is it possible? I don't know what congressional testimony should give in on the on the I mean, ransom payments. It really does. It really does fly in the face of government transparency. If government officials are not accountable to the public and can actually plead the fifth when asked questions about basic governance. That is a problem. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a disaster. Okay, so what does this mean for the, for the election? We're talking to Dana Perino. Her new book is Let Me Tell You About Jasper, How My Best Friend Became America's Dog, which we'll get to in a minute. But, uh, but, I, wanna, but I have to ask you, Dana, uh, you know, as, we're 11 days from the election. Donald Trump has been gaining in, in the real clear politics poll average. He's, he's within shouting distance, if not spitting distance, uh, in this election. Uh, most of the swing states, he's still down, although several of them are narrow, like places like Florida and Ohio. Do you think that this is enough to shift the election to basically dead heat again running up to the election? Well, maybe it could get to, like, within two points, right? So she's up about six point, five to six points in the average, um, just three points in the Fox poll. I'd point out ten points in the 
NBC Wall Street Journal poll. So I think five to six points is probably correct, and I would have said that as of um, noon today. Now, can she get, can, I'm sorry, can Donald Trump then get this to within two or three points? Yes, maybe. Um, and that's probably where the country is, right, in terms yeah. of a polarized electorate. Um, I, I wanted to take you on a trip down memory lane real quick because an October surprise like this, a question might arise of when has an October surprise ever changed the outcome of an election? And I don't know presidential history as well as my co-host on that podcast that I do. Um, I'll tell you what, um, with Chris Starwalt, but I can tell you about 2000. Yep. Going into 2000, Gore in, in a couple of polls was up a couple points. In about two or three polls, George W. Bush was up a couple points. So it was really a dead heat. And nobody had Al Gore winning the popular vote, even though he ended up doing so. Um, and it goes into a, uh, it goes to the Electoral College, and obviously we have the recount that takes 36 days. But what was it that maybe held George W. Bush back from winning outright on that first night? It was when there was an October surprise drop by the Al Gore campaign that George Bush had had a DUI um, in his early 20s that he had never uh, revealed. Right, exactly. And so it is said, and Carl Rove wrote about in his book, Courage and Consequence, that about 2 to 3% of evangelicals decided to stay home. And that made all the difference. Yep. I mean, so the, this, this could make a big difference, which brings me to another question, which is, I have to assume at this point that Hillary has to have some sort of stock of, of Donald Trump oppo research that she's going to dump on Monday, because time runs short. Maybe she thought she could live this out, but... You might not be able to wait till Monday. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, Five minutes from now. Something like this. Yeah, you've got, you have to muddy the waters. Remember, actually, this happened not too long ago, where Hillary Clinton... Their team put out something about one of the women attacking Trump, and then he put out something right after that, like an hour later. Oh, it was WikiLeaks. Yep. It was WikiLeaks. That happened an hour later. So, um, yes, I imagine that they probably held something back in the op- in the event that they needed to see if they could, you know, muddy the waters a bit. Her poll numbers have um, – he, he, Donald Trump has never, actually never led her in a national poll. But she has been able to widen the gap with him um, once in August and again in October. But each time he's been able to close that gap. And just the way that politics works, this is – like good timing for Donald Trump, obviously. Yeah, it's certainly great timing for Trump. Although I have to say, it gives, a, it gives you a good reason of not to support early voting. Oh well, you know, th- I mean, this is a perfect reason. I mean, th- there are people on the right who have been saying this for for years that early voting is a disservice to the voters because obviously new information drops in the last days of a campaign, and this is it. Yeah. And I expect that when Hillary Clinton drops the the as I said earlier, the sex tape of Donald Trump with a horse in three hours, that that'll probably impact the voting as well. So it, it's every bad piece of information about both these candidates. We'll be we'll be hanging on the on the clothesline momentarily. So uh, all that you said, know the other thing that is going to oh I'm sorry oh no go ahead go ahead. I was going to say there's another thing that this does for Republicans and forget about Trump. So Trump's obviously going to take this to the bank, but it does what it does for down ballot Republicans yeah. is allows them to not have to talk about Trump for the fall, for the last weekend before the election. That's a great point. It's a great point, negative. especially because right? so, so yeah, so many people like Nikki Haley are jumping on board, as I mentioned just before you came on, and you're exactly right. Now they yep. get to talk about Hillary instead of about Trump. It's a great, great point. So it could help them really a lot in, in these Senate races. So, Dana, one of the things that people have been talking about and they're worried about uh, is, let's say that, that Donald Trump is not able to to pull this out at the last minute, and let's say that, that he loses because the polls say right now he's going to. How does the Republican Party come back together after this? Is it possible that they come back together after this if Trump is unable to benefit from this new news and he goes on to lose anyway, or is this just going to be a constant firefight for the next couple of years? I'm reluctant to predict. I don't know. I feel like all the gloves have been off for this year. You've been the target of it. Yeah. So have I. <laughs> Um, you know, people that um, you've been friends with for years or that you at least were thought you were ideologically aligned with, maybe you're no longer speaking to them. I have a couple of friends like that. I'm like, what? how did this happen? <laughs> um, and I do understand the, the school of thought that says Hillary Clinton is the great uniter of the Republican Party. But if that were true, then she would be she would be the one that's um, down in the polls by five to six points, not Trump. Yeah, I think I think that's um, right. So, you know, post-election. So. Yeah, do you think that post-election, I, I've sort of broken it down into three categories on my end. I think that there's okay. there's the, the ardent Trumpers, there are the people who are conservative and, and never Trump, and then there are the establishment folks. And uh, and I think that 
the establishment folks who some of whom are voting for many of whom are voting for for Trump to to to, to defeat Hillary some conservatives who are voting Trump to defeat Hillary I think the the question is going to be whether they can come together with the conservative never Trump or whether the Trump ardent Trump supporters are going to convince the the people who voted for Trump while holding their nose that the never Trumpers were to blame for Trump losing that the and if and so that the kind of stabbed in the back myth is going to be the great definer of what happens next if people believe that never Trump is responsible for Trump losing then they're going to be the outcasts and if and if people don't believe that then the people who who are sort of the interior Trump group are going to be treated just like any other losing Republican candidate and they'll sort of fade into the woodwork. That I think yes I, I'm actually I think I agree with all that. Um, and I'm really interested, though, on the policy front, what happens. So there's the blame game that will happen. But then going forward, is it a party that unites to fight for free trade or against free trade? Mm. Is it the party that unites to push for um, entitlement reform or one that says, no, we should actually expand entitlement? Um, I, I think it's even deeper than just... Uh, character flaws you might find in either candidate, um, but in, in Donald Trump, if you don't want to vote for him, and you're thinking he's not a conservative, he's con ours, all the things that he's been called by Republicans, not just Democrats, then I don't know how you get back to a policy framework where you can agree upon. Now, the Democrats have that. They have a flawed candidate, but they are united in their policy uh, goals. Yep, and, uh, and so I think that's a problem. Yeah, well, we're definitely going to have to come. But they, they, the way they became united in their in their policy goals is when they purged the party of any moderates over the past eight years. I mean, it's it's amazing how they've 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 culled their. But what if they gain a whole bunch of these um, college educated whites, especially females? Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. And what? And that's like a, a great political realignment. But I don't know what it looks like at the end of two years. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Dana. And I think that that's that's one of the things that I've always thought was dangerous about the Trump candidacy is that every growing demographic in the United States is moving significantly out of the Republican column in this election cycle. Even if Trump were to win, that's true. So, you know, white college-educated women are moving dramatically out of the Trump column, out of the Republican column. Hispanics and blacks are moving out of the Republican column. Uh, young people are, are really moving out of the Republican column, and that's going to have some, some lasting impact, not just for policy on the right, but, but also for policy on the left. If people just buy into the left because they feel the right is so toxic, you could actually see a real upsurge in leftism, unless the right unites around something that's not so toxic, hopefully policies that work. Okay, so Dana, I, I'm, I'm honor-bound to ask you about your book now, because we've because you've given us so much time on politics. But uh, for, for all of us who are going to be, in, in a week and a half, in two weeks, everybody is going to be burned out on a lot of this stuff. And your, your new book, Let Me Tell You About Jasper, How My Best Friend Became America's Dog, uh, is going to be at the top of the New York Times bestseller list for sure. And in, yeah. what is what is the, can you give people kind of a snapshot of, of what what you're going to get from the book? Um, I questioned my publisher on the timing of the release of this book. I said, "Are you sure?" Right in the middle <laughs> of the election, <laughs> and they said, "By the time we get to there, that date, which was last Tuesday, people are going to want a distraction and a little bit of a lift." Um, what I hope is to help remind people. One, I just wanted to share some joy. Like I get to write a book about my dog. I can't believe that. I did a, something a little bit different. I added what I think is some excellent modern art, uh, computer-generated <laughs> art through Photoshop by a guy I met on Twitter named Five Fan Photoshop, and he takes my dog pictures that I post, and, and he puts them in all sorts of different hilarious scenes throughout American history, <laughs> art, pop culture, sports. So I feel like it's a book that's accessible for a lot of people, not just... Um, Adults, but I, I also think kids will like it. In fact, Megan Kelly told me her little boy takes it to bed with him because I gave them an early copy, and he <laughs> loves to look at the pictures when he wakes up in the morning. Um, and also, I'm trying to find a way to help people remember that um, we have a lot more in common than we might think at the end of this election season. Um, part of that is our love for animals and dogs, and if you've had a pet, then you know what it's like to give them a nickname and to have a best friend when you're feeling blue, and also to... Um, help them through the end of their life phase when they die and that grief that never goes away and there's some, there's some common bonds that we have because of the joy of these animals well the book is let me tell you about jasper how my best friend became america's dog guest is dana perino so dana i have to ask you one more question on this i'm not a dog owner i've never been a dog owner and i've had many people trying to convince me to to get a dog for years and years and years and i have a couple of small kids one two and a half and one just under six months, and uh, and I figured that if anyone can make the case for owning a dog, you could probably do it best. So so let's hear let's hear the pitch. I have a saying that every kid needs a dog and every dog needs a kid, 
it not only teaches you responsibility, but it softens your heart. And I do think that you become a better human being and a better adult if you grow up with having a dog. I think your kids are a little too young right now, so you're not going to have to run out tonight and find a dog. But I would say when the kids are around seven and six, besides they're going to be lobbying you for one anyway, <laughs> that's around the time I would get one because they will be better human beings because of it. Okay, well, that, that's actually a solid pitch. Okay, so good news, I get to wait five years before I have to worry about it. <laughs> but, <that's, Yes. laughs> but when when the time comes, then I will then I will definitely uh, I'll definitely be be listening to that advice. The book is Let Me Tell You About Jasper: How My Best Friend Became America's Dog, the Great Dana Perino. Thanks so much for joining the show. I'm sure you're going to have a busy day, and uh, and based It'll on it'll be a busy day. But what I'm looking forward to is at the end of this election, the first novel I'm going to read is your new one. Oh, I appreciate it. that's very kind of you. So mine is much more depressing than than your book. Your book is uplifting. Mine is <laughs> mine is all death and depression and, and horror. So uh, all right, it'll, it'll be my chaser. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I really appreciate Dana Perino. Thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Bye, Ben. Bye. All right. So, so folks, again, the breaking news today, in case you've been living under a rock, is that Hillary Clinton. The investigation has been reopened by the FBI because what the hell can happen next in this election cycle? I don't know. Do you? <laughs> I'm willing to take. I'm willing to take guess, uh, guesses. I, I, I have no clue. I've, I've given up on predicting this thing. My predictions, has, in the general, have been very accurate thus far. Uh, if, if I have to give a prediction, I don't want to be Debbie Downer today. So I'm not going to tell you that I think that Donald Trump will find a way to screw this up. But uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, just based on based on previous history, I have a feeling that the media will find some excuse to pick on something that Donald Trump does, and then and then flip the script and and make it all about Donald Trump. If he's disciplined, this should help him. Is he too far behind, too late in the campaign? My guess is probably yes. But it's going to be, it's just the worst of all possible things is going to happen in this election. I'm not sure what that is yet, but it will happen. That's my, that's my main prediction. So we have to say goodbye to the folks on Facebook. You were really lucky today. You got 45 minutes on Facebook, gang. So Facebook and YouTube. But if you want to subscribe and watch the rest, we have much more coming here on The Ben Shapiro Show, believe it or not, to the laments of my producers. And uh, go to dailywire.com, become a subscriber, $8 a month, and you can get the novel that Dana Perino just mentioned, True Allegiance, which is coming out in print November 1st, but you can get a signed copy right now if you go to dailywire.com and get an annual subscription. And uh, we, uh, we're, we thank you, of course, for being a part of the largest conservative podcast in America. <laughs> 